Thank you very much, James. One of the reasons I love this night so much is that you walk across this huge stage, which is a massive space, and we've got this big, if also quite intimate, space out here, and the whole of the evening is concentrated on this lectern and the one person standing there and their voice, as though huge things can be distilled down to tiny things, which is what poetry does. And Tyler Bergen's fantastic book, The Tragic Death of Eleanor Marx, really does that. Um, the book is on one level about the tragic death of Eleanor Marx, but what it's also about is, I think, about translation. It's about translation and the imperfectibility of translation. One of my favorite poems in the book is just a six-line poem that's a kind of found poem, which is six different translations of one line from Emma Bovary uh, in, in, by several hands. And it strikes me that that is what this book is. It's an attempt to translate the whole of this, the whole of existence, the whole of a life, the whole of a history into language that we can understand, but also at the same time realizing that language is always ambiguous and that what we want to say at this lectern is surrounded by all the things we could have said and all the things we could have heard. And I think Tara does that wonderfully and brilliantly. Tara Bergen. Hello. The title of my book is The Tragic Death of Eleanor Marx, and it came out of a study that I was doing of Flaubert's Madame Bovary. And while I was reading all about this and doing this study, I discovered that the first official English translation of Madame Bovary had been made by the daughter of Karl Marx, Eleanor. And then I also read that she had apparently committed suicide in almost exactly the same way that Emma Bovary commits suicide in the novel, which is by swallowing poison. And I just found this um, not just a sad, very sad story, but also an extremely powerful image that this translator would have translated the source so literally and so faithfully and with such tragic consequences. This is the true story of Eleanor Marx in 10 parts. One, Eleanor of the eight hour day gets betrayed by Edward of the two faces. She orders chloroform with just some traces of prussic acid blue, a beautiful imitation. Two, she says it's for the dog, but she is the dog. Three, the housekeeper finds her dressed in white. It's not her bridal dress, she's not a bride. It's from her childhood. She lies as if asleep. She has strangely purple cheeks. Four, in her white muslin dress, she is laid out. Five, the coroner is exasperated with feeble Edward. Coroner, was the deceased your wife? Edward, legally? Coroner, were you married to the deceased? Edward, not legally. Coroner, what was her age? Edward, 40? She was 43. Six. On Tuesday, fire, but the phoenix, god of suicide, doesn't rise, and Edward doesn't claim her because now he has a real wife. Seven, so the urn that holds the ashes of the soft summer dress and of the woman who knew the power of the proletariat and of the chunk of poisoned apple that she bit under duress is taken to the offices of the SDF. Eight, the offices are in Maiden Lane. Nine, and in the offices in Maiden Lane, there is a cupboard with two glass panes 
and there they place her to remain for years and years. Her tears are dew, and she crushes nothing. 10. Nearly all of this is true. Like many of us here, I'm sure, my life is a balance between writing and trying to make a living through teaching. And a couple of years ago, I got my first job as a university lecturer, and I had to do a teacher training course, and part of this meant reading a lot of text about higher education teaching and learning strategies, which I found now not maybe my choice reading material. And I was struggling a bit trying to read all this stuff until my eye fell on the title of one of the chapters of these books. And I cheered up immediately because I thought to myself, aha, that, that's got to be a title for a poem. So of course I had to go and write it and here it is. Making Robert learn like Susan. <laughs> Everybody wants Robert to learn like Susan. But there are always more Roberts than Susans, aren't there? Blaming Robert isn't helpful. Susan is by nature a deep learner. It's easy for her, she's not like Robert, trying to show off with big words like opaque or transubstantiation. <laughs> Silly Robert. He has memorized them from a book. He doesn't know their real meanings because Robert is a surface learner, whereas Susan is deep. <laughs> Blaming Robert isn't helpful. What we need is to take all the Roberts from this world and make them Susans. Dying. I waited until everyone was out of the house. I waited until there was nothing on the horizon. Nothing in the diary, nothing in the notebook, nothing at my writing hand at all. Until my writing hand was hardly ever being used. Then I got everything ready. The stopwatch, the deep stainless steel bowl, the bottle of salt, the packet of blue powder. Back went the dial on the old stopwatch until it was tight and began to count me down. In went the warm water. In went the five tablespoons of salt. In went the packet of grainy blue dye. Then in went my stiff wooden hand. In went my out of fashion hand. And it held itself down for 22 seconds and then another 22. It agitated itself and drowned itself out in the blue. It lost oxygen and turned the color of the sea, the sea from a foreign point of view. It turned dark, cold, airless blue, as if it had not breathed for some time. And just as it assumed the appropriate shade, just as it turned into a deep and dying blue, the stopwatch gave way and rang its alarm. I lifted my hand up from the sink. It looked shrunken. It looked taboo. And for all that week, I admired my new hand. I sat at the table, leafing through free magazines, proud of finally taking the time to renew it so thoroughly. I spoke on the telephone, distracted by the newness of my hand. I sat at the computer, trying it out, awkwardly tapping all of the wrong keys. Yes, I thought, this is very me. Thank you.